Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. This is a forum that we have been running really since the beginning of the global pandemic. And we have more than 3,200 people participating in the English forum alone. We've now added forums in Arabic, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. We're offering at least six webinars per week across those languages with health experts, journalism trainers, leaders in the fight against disinformation. If you're on Facebook, you can just search for the group ICFJ, Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. And if you're not on Facebook, just go to icfj.org and click on the COVID-19 resource page where you can sign up for newsletters so you'll know about upcoming webinars and read about previous ones. And please do visit ijnet.org uh, for a wealth of resources about covering the pandemic and other journalism topics in eight languages. We're expanding the scope of the forum today to include the issue that, that did what I thought was going to be impossible this year, which is to drive the pandemic news off the front page. Since we all saw the shocking video of George Floyd being killed by a police officer in Minneapolis, protests have erupted all over the United States and even in many other countries. The protests are not limited to the death of George Floyd. They are about a long and brutal history of police violence in the United States against people of color. A smaller part of the story, but an important one for us, has been the attacks on journalists who have been covering the protests. We've seen journalists hit by rubber bullets, pepper spray, often when they were clearly identifying themselves as media. We've seen journalists hit and shoved by police. We've seen journalists arrested when they were reporting from previously agreed upon locations. Most of the attacks have been committed by police, but some have been by protesters. We really have an outstanding panel today to talk about these issues, and I'd like to introduce them now. Linda Tirado is a freelance photojournalist and author from Nashville who drove to Minneapolis to document the protests. Despite wearing goggles and quite clearly being a working journalist, she was shot in the eye by a compressed foam bullet, which is a little different from what we thought before. It is not a, was not a rubber bullet, but a compressed foam bullet. And she has likely permanently lost her vision in that eye. Brandon Hunter is a neighborhood reporter for the Detroit Free Press, the newspaper of his native city. As he recently recounted to the Washington Post, he was singled out by police as the only African-American in a group of reporters covering the protests in Detroit. Maria Salazar Ferro is the emergencies director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, which worked across the globe to promote press freedom. And I can't tell you how many times I have turned to Maria when we at ICFJ have encountered journalists in danger around the world. Such an important resource. And lastly, Amir Khan is an Indian photojournalist who works a great deal in his native Kashmir. He has won many awards for his work, including the Human Rights Press Award this year and the Agence France Press's Kate Webb Prize last year. He has been attacked numerable times by security forces while covering unrest in Kashmir. Now, before we begin talking, I, I want to remind you that we welcome your questions in this webinar. If you're watching us on Zoom, just post your questions in the chat, and I'll be able to see them from there. If you're watching on Facebook Live, post your questions there, and one of my colleagues will pass them on to me. So we're going to start with Linda. Linda, just uh, looking at you, we can see the aftermath of what happened in Minneapolis. Um, can you just tell us, tell us what happened um, that night? Um, yeah, so I had been taking photos um, on Lake Street uh, at a bank, and uh, it was about 15 minutes before curfew when we started getting reports from protesters that police had opened fire with tear gas um, without uh, any just Personal warnings and and previous to that curfew, um, so I put on my gear and and headed down to the precincts. Um, it had to have been within, you know, twenty minutes, half an hour of that time. Um, I was lining up a shot and I just kind of felt my face explode. Um, my goggles came off and obviously working in gas um, between that and, and the blood from the face laceration, um, I just sort of closed my eyes and started yelling, I'm press, I'm press. And uh, protesters came, took my hand, said, you know, come with us, we're going to take you to the medics. 
Um, they took me to one of their medic stations, bandaged me a bit, and then drove me to the hospital. And I was in surgery, you know, within an hour of the injury. So, um, and then I woke up the next day half blind. So that was uh, mm -hmm. the very short version. Um, it's It's been difficult to establish exactly where I was because it was only my second day on location. Um, I had come in on, on Thursday night the previous evening and I'd been out for a few hours, but not enough to really orient myself in Minneapolis or, or understand, you know, how the streets work or anything like that. Usually on location, that'll take, you know, three or four days at least, so. Yeah, uh, and um, what what is the situation for your, your future in terms of, of being able to see? Do you know for sure that you will not be able to see out of that eye again? Yeah, it's it's very sure that I won't be able. Um, I, I will have some light and shadow, which is to say, um, you know, if somebody passes directly between me and a bright light source, um, I will be able to temporarily see that that light dimmer and know that somebody is passing by. Um, but that's uh, that's their hopeful prognosis. So um, that's what they're hoping I'll be able to get to in, in about six months. And when we're already starting to see a little bit of that. When I went in for my checkup, I could tell them whether they were flashing the light on or off. Um, and they were really hopeful about that. But yeah, there's 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 no question that I'll, I'll regain sight in any meaningful way in my left eye. And is that going to affect your, your ability to, to shoot? Oh, hell no. They only got my left eye. Um, yeah, I, I shoot with my right eye. So I, I think I would be a lot less sanguine about it had they, you know, taken my right eye because then I would have to learn to reshoot um, but, or relearn to shoot. But, uh, you know, as it is, I always have my left eye closed when I'm, you know, looking through a lens anyway. Okay. So this almost might be weirdly helpful. Um, what I have found is without the depth perception, I, I literally see the world um, already as a photo. And so what I'm actually really interested in is to see how my, how my photos might change with this new perception because I don't have to go review my photos and see how they turned out. I already see it that way now. So now it's gonna be a question of, you know, did I get them in focus? So it's, it's um, I mean, artistically and professionally speaking, um, it's, weirdly interesting <laughs> I mean you know you don't want to be too positive about going blind but uh you know there it, it could have been um you know substantially worse uh, had I not been wearing goggles uh, it likely would have killed me um had they been you know a couple of millimeters to the right or left it might have killed me um so as far as getting shot in the face by cops like I walked away fairly unscathed um and and certainly more unscathed than you know the people that the protests were sparked about um who who have so often lost their lives or or been you know permanently paralyzed um and things of that nature so it's it's you know, what are they going to do? You Take are, and see you are remarkably, remarkably upbeat about something that I think most people would be utterly devastated by a week after it happened. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I'm not allowed to cry for two weeks. Uh, so it's mostly gallows humor uh, all the way. The, yeah, the, yeah. the world of eye related humor is now open to me in, in ways that were previously inaccessible. Do you feel that um, that the police were targeting you and other journalists, or was it just pure chance that that you were the one hit? Um, you know, I think specifically as to my injury, I haven't been able to establish that. I do know that I had a mark around on my backpack, which is a fluorescent paint that they tag protesters with um, so that they can later target them. I think that mm -hmm. we have plenty of evidence from other journalists that Minneapolis PD was targeting journalists. We had, you know, the night before that CNN crew arrested live on TV. Um, same night I got shot, we had three or four other incidents where, where Minneapolis PD um, definitely did target working journalists and knew. Um, I think that there was no way you could see a photographer with pro gear um, lining up a shot wearing my credentials around my neck, even if they, you know, weren't 100% who I was with, it was clear I wasn't with protesters and it was clear I was working media. Um, with that said, uh, either they targeted me or I just happened to catch around that they were indiscriminately firing into a crowd and I'm not really sure that that's better. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't really know what outcome I should be hoping for there when we do finally um, get to get the investigative work done and kind of nail down specifically what happened to me. I'm not really sure what I should be going for that they targeted me because yeah. I'm not sure whether they were just spraying bullets. Is there investigative work being done now to figure out exactly what happened? I mean, oh, are yeah, people I working on 
Yeah, I was back at work five hours after they let me out of the hospital on Saturday. Um, I, 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 I don't know what they thought was going to happen when they pissed off the press, but we just start investigating harder. Um, and so we've been tracking down uh, the street medics that helped me. We've been looking for eyewitnesses. Um, I'm subpoenaing or, or, or FOIA requesting uh, the city camera footage from the two or three block radius I might have been in. Um, we've got requests in the police department to find out precisely what rounds there were because I had thought it was a rubber bullet. Um, and I'd said, said as much to the New York Times. New York Times went back to MPD and they said, no, no, we haven't used rubber bullets in 20 years. We don't know what you're talking about. Any civilian that thinks they may have been injured can call our oversight board and register a complaint. And I thought, well, screw that. So, um, you know, we've been looking in, in other directions. So that's how we found out. Um, it was another journalist found out about the foam bullets. Um, and sent me a link to the manufacturers. So now we're trying to run down which of two manufacturers um, Minneapolis has a contract with so we can find out precisely what I got hit with and, and things of those nature, so. Okay, we're gonna come back to you, Linda. Um, we're gonna make sure everybody has a chance to, to say a little bit about their own experiences. Let's, let's move on to Brandon. Brandon, uh, you were covering protests in Detroit, and I think the incident we're talking about might have happened on the same night as what happened to Linda, but uh, in a recent Washington Post story that was about the unique experiences of black journalists covering uh, these issues, uh, you talked about being singled out by police in a group of reporters where you were the only one who was African American. Can you tell us about what happened? Right, so this was uh, last Saturday, I'm not sure the date, but it was on Saturday night, um, the most violent night in Detroit. And it was a couple, of, there was like scene number two uh, of that night. And um, the protesters, a few agitators tried to break into the Nike store down here, trying to mimic what was happening in, in Minneapolis, but they weren't able to get through the glass. And so they headed north on Wilbur Avenue, which is our main street here in Detroit. And they met the, the police line and who, who started deploying tear gas. So I ran back a couple blocks and I met up with my, my, my colleagues at the Free Press who were all white. And um, I had tear gas in my eyes because that night I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have a gas mask that night. And when, while I'm wiping the tear gas out of my eye, you can see in the video where the DPD cop comes up with a shotgun and points it at me and telling me to move. And you can see me frantically with my uh, press credentials saying, I'm pressed, I'm pressed. And my colleagues saying the same thing. And then two, leak, two, uh, two seconds later, they threw another canister of tear gas at us and we, and we had to run. Um, you know, so people ask me, what happened, what happened, what happened? I said, well, you know, yeah, I'm, a, I'm young, I'm 30 years old. I'm the only, one of the only black journalists at the Free Press. And uh, I had on streetwear, I have some Jordan ones, my Black Panther jacket. And I, and I fit the description of the protesters, right? They were young African-American men from Detroit. I'm a young African-American man from Detroit. And you, you couldn't tell me apart from them except for my press badge. And to me, that explains why he walked past everybody else, even though we were screaming press and pointing the gun mm -hmm. Um, trying to tell me to move. So, so literally pointing a gun at you. Yes. And what did he say? Um, he said, "Move, he say? move, move." That's what he was saying. And I had my press pass up. Like, I'm press, I'm press, I'm press. And you hear my colleagues in the video saying, "He's press, he's press." And then he said, "Okay." And then two seconds later, someone else still threw a canister at us, and we had to run. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! Is this? Um, a unique experience for you or is this something that you figure is going to happen every time you're out on the streets covering something like uh, this? I mean in other fields you know people don't really believe that you're in your media you know because I don't fit that description I don't look like the rest of everybody else so, um, I've never had anything that, uh, you know this hostile at a gun pointing at you or uh, you know tear gas thrown at you yeah. uh, so this is my first time covering protests and I never expected this so you know we prepared for it um, and still to this point DPD is still ignoring um, media members. I've had a few of my colleagues arrested, had the zip ties put on their hands, and DPD has given us media passes. They've given us media passes mm -hmm. to put on our bodies, and the officers still ignore it and arrest people. So, you know, we, we out there just trying to be careful and, and still cover our story as well. Have you talked to other African-American journalists about their experience, and do you think this is something that's uh, shared by, by Black journalists everywhere? Yeah, I mean, I've been on a couple of interviews um, you know, around the country and I'm talking to black journalists who share the same experiences, you know, of, of being profiled because of the color of their skin, um, not being believed that, that we're journalists. That hasn't happened here in Detroit, but, you know, doing these interviews, uh, people will definitely share the same story of saying, 
you know, um, the only thing that separates me is, is the color of my skin. And if I didn't have this press mm -hmm. badge, they would think I was a protester as well. Right. As, uh, as um, Linda mentioned earlier, of course, um, a black CNN journalist, uh, Omar um, Jimenez and, the, and his crew were arrested in Minneapolis. Um, and in that case, one of the things that struck a lot of people was that he was so calm, you know, talking very calmly about, you know, this is where we were supposed to be, but you want us to go somewhere else, we'll go somewhere else. And it struck me that, um, you know, often I'm guessing uh, not just journalists, but African Americans in general need to take a different tone um, when they're talking to the police or, or things could get bad. Do you find that to be true? Oh, yes. Um, this is, I think the day, at, the day after we were in front of DPD, Protesters trying to mimic uh, Minneapolis, trying to break into the uh, headquarters of DPD. And so they kept selling it off. And, you know, once it got underway, once the mayhem got underway, um, a DPD officer uh, shoved down one of my, my reporter friends. I mean, right when it started. And we were just, we media, we media, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go? And, you know, just kind of almost begging, like, please just don't arrest me. Yeah. What do you want me to do? And, yeah, so you really have to have to be calm with the people because when their adrenaline is running, they're just ready for some action. That's all that is. They, they just want. They don't care who you are, and that was the tone out there the last seven days with DPD. So you're pretty much trying to make friends with these people so that you can still do your job and not get arrested, and, and not get tear gas and not get hit with a bullet. Right. Wow. Okay. We'll we'll come back to Brandon as well, but um, now I'm going to move on to Maria Salazar Ferro uh, from the Committee to Protect Journalists. Maria, when I uh, wrote a description of this um, panel. Uh, I looked at your website to see how many uh, press freedom violations you had tracked up to that point. This was like three days ago, and it was 125. When I looked this morning, it's 250. So this is escalating uh, really, really rapidly. Can you kind of give us an overall perspective of, of what's happening around the country? Well, let me start. First of all, Patrick, thank you so much for having me here. Um, but, and actually, I thank you for, to Brandon and Linda. It's, it's really an honor to be on this with you guys. Um, but uh, now back to the numbers. Uh, since the last time we checked uh, overnight, we are up to 300 incidents we're um, investigating of attacks on journalists and media around the country linked to the protests. Um, they're everywhere. We're looking at incidents everywhere. The top cities that we have, uh, where we have been investigating cases are, unsurprisingly, Minneapolis, but then LA, DC, Louisville, and New York. But again, let me say it's happening all over the place. We're looking at different kinds of um, incidents. We're looking at arrests, assaults, equipment and user ma uh, damage, as well as assault. And this is still, we're still investigating these cases, but in about 80% of the cases, the perpetrators believe to be the police. Um, and the other cases, uh, it is certainly protesters as as Linda um, pointed out, but again, it's eighty percent of perpetrators are believed to be are believed to be police. Um, this this is unprecedented. Um, we have never covered anything like this in the U.S. Um, and uh, internally, we have moved a lot of resources to focus on the U.S. When usually, as you mentioned, Patrick, we are a global organization. Um, we are trying to support journalists who are doing this in the U.S., and we can talk a little bit more about this, but are also mindful of what this um, situation is going to meet, mean for journalists um, working, covering protests in other parts of the world. Actually, that was one of my questions, so let's go there. What, what, uh, um, you know, what do you think is going to be the impact beyond our borders? Well, I mean, let's, let's, let's start with... Um, I, I quickly looked at the news this morning, and let's start with uh, China. Is uh, what is it? The, the foreign minister uh, tweeted, uh, "I can't breathe." Um, Iran is also using um, a lot of uh, the context of the U.S. to criticize the U.S. And China and Iran are certain, are historically some of the worst places to work as a journalist. Um, so that, that's the beginning. We have definitely seen that a lot of the re rhetoric that is being used in the U.S. around fake news, the critical um, messaging around journalists and media is being picked up around the world in places like Brazil and the Philippines. Again, 
This is where it's really, really hard to work as a journalist, where journalists are being routinely killed, where they are arrested. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I can, I, we still don't know how this is going to play out around protests, but looking at the way it has, it could certainly have um, a devastating impact for journalists recovering protests. And, and what else is CPJ and other uh, press freedom organizations beyond just documenting? What else are you doing to try and minimize these incidents? Anything, uh, any kind of advocacy campaigns or anything like that going on? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. We are, we have, uh, most importantly, I think one of the exciting things that, are, that I am seeing happen is we're joining forces. Um, we're, we're working together, organizations that um, defend freedom of expression, that defend um, journalists are working together um, to, to unite our voice. We are writing to authorities, we're writing to authorities at the, or advocating with authorities at the national level, but also at the um, state and city level. We're working on uh, reaching out to, to police. Um, and, uh, you know, you, it's our bread and butter advocating. So we're, ho we're hoping to reach out to authorities, to police, to um, inform them and to really demand that, that the journalists uh, be allowed to continue to cover safely these protests because it's crucial to, to what's happening. Uh, but additionally, we are doing a lot of work to support journalists who are out there. So a lot of people may not be as experienced as I think Linda is uh, and may need additional support. So we have, uh, CPJ has a safety advisory uh, that is very simple to follow with a lot of tips. And I am going to go ahead and plug this in here, but we also have safety advisors that are available free of charge to anyone who has specific questions, who wants to talk to them, who wants to go over how, what they can do to protect themselves. Um, very important when you're thinking about safety to remember, as you said at the beginning, I think Patrick, uh, the, the COVID-19 story has been overtaken by the protest story. But the truth is when you're talking about safety, the protests are part of the COVID-19 story. And one of the, one of the issues that um, is most concerning is uh, that journalists are out there uh, working as safely as they can. Um, so that all this information is available. We are also teaming up with other organizations to find lawyers for anybody who may, who may need a lawyer, who may need legal support. Um, and just looking to be able to provide hand-on hands -on assistance to, to journalists, to newsrooms um, who are covering this. Of course, as I said, it's unprecedented. So um, there are people who have covered protests, there are people who have covered pro protests abroad, but I don't think that um, uh, the, the information on how to stay safe is, has been uh, broadly available to American journalists. Yeah. And just real quick, anybody can find all of these resources at cpj.org. Um, any, any other specific advice on, on where to find the resources they need to protect themselves? Uh, yes, definitely cpj.org. You can look at our Staying Safe um, uh, component of the website. You can also follow the hashtag CPJ Emergencies, and that will guide you to all our safety information. You can sign up to receive this information. Uh, but I think there are, uh, there are also other um, organizations that are doing great work. I would definitely look at um, RCFP, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. They have really good information. They also have a legal hotline. Write their legal hotline number on your arm if you're going out to protest. Uh -huh. They'll help you find a lawyer. They're available 24-7. And then PEN America also has fantastic resources, including a really new... Um, they, they just published it this week, a new um, document detailing uh, new protest laws. So that gives you an idea so that you're also informed ahead of going to protest about what the laws are in different states. Again, to Linda's point, you, if you're not from that place, you may not be familiar with, with, the, with the legal restrictions. Right. Um, another, uh, and I do want to mention too that, that on ijnet.org, we are collating a lot of these resources from obviously CPJ. Um, we, we put a lot of your resources up there so that people know the work that you're doing and how it can help them, but some of the other organizations as well. One more question for you, Maria. Um, I just want to see if you think, is it fair to ascribe some of what's happening to the president, given his rhetoric about journalists as enemies of the people and constant purveyors of fake news, um, what what is how, where does CPJ stand on that? 
I mean, as said, the, the rhetoric that is being, um, that has been used in the US um, recently is definitely stoking the fire. It, it is definitely coming from the president, but it's rhetoric that's being used by um, local officials as well, uh, you know, ag against the press. Uh, all that said, you know, this is, this, this, this is unprecedented in the volume and the mass of attacks, but it isn't new. There were journalists who were arrested covering Standing Rock, who were arrested in Missouri. Um, and it's, it's something that has been escalating. Um, but certainly the, the, the general rhetoric against the, the, against the press, I think emboldens other attacks uh, and emboldens um, uh, people who, who, who are bothered by journalists. Yeah, okay. Again, we'll come back to Maria. Uh, Amr, we're going to talk to you. We, we thought it was really important, to, especially because ICFJ's audience is, is very much global, to bring in an international perspective. Um, you know, what's happening here in the United States, and Maria referred to this, um, is, is much more commonplace for journalists in many other parts of the world and, and can be more deadly, uh, can be fatal for, for journalists in, in many places. So, um, you cover Kashmir, which is the, of, of course, a restive part of India, uh, where there is a, a movement to secure independence from India, and not the only place you cover, but that is is where you won a lot of your awards and that type of thing. How common is it for you to be targeted by security forces when you've been covering unrest in Kashmir or other places of India? Uh, like I mentioned, uh, Brendan mentioned, you know, even if you have the press card, it doesn't work uh, on all the places because, you know, if, if police wants to attack you, they will attack you. And obviously you're, you know, showing the brutality of the police to the global audience and they don't like it. So you pretty much get uh, caught in the action. But the difference between Kashmir or, you know, any other place as compared to US is that here we don't get documented how they are attacking the press as compared to the uh, to to the states you know uh, so it's pretty common but you don't get to see it uh, quite often you know but what do you, mean you don't get to happened? see it it's it's because the 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 government is controlling information so so these kinds of stories don't get out to the public i mean they have a report but what what i mean is visually you don't see visual attacks on the press you know as as we are seeing in the uh, us right now uh, I mean, there have been reports, there are uh, dozens of reports of, you know, uh, of journalists being attacked in Kashmir or India or in other South Asian countries, but you don't see the evidence of uh, police thrashing the uh, media men. Very rarely you will see a lot of videos out there. So it's, it's nothing new for us. Mm -hmm. Is that because there isn't a, you know, here what's happening is that because everybody has a camera in their pocket, they're documenting everything they see, but that's not really happening in the places you're working? Very rare, you know, there's a couple of incidents where uh, people have recorded uh, a police beating, uh, uh, you know, uh, media per personnel, you know. One of my colleagues got hit uh, in his eye with a pellet gun and he also lost one of his eye and can't see it right now. Uh, two uh, journalists are still uh, languishing in the jail, you know, for the last, uh, what, 18 months? And, uh, you know, uh, the CPJ has been uh, doing a lot of work for them, but, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's of the government. They don't care about, care about these advocacy groups, uh, but, you know, we, we got to do what we need to do. You know, these groups are really important for us. Uh, these are small places. Yeah. As, as kind of referring back to what Brandon was talking about, have you ever felt like you were targeted as a Muslim or as a Kashmiri journalist? Kashmiri, yes. Uh, you know, when I travel across India, th there's a big problem that he's a Kashmiri, he's a journalist, and he's a Muslim. So I, I, was, I was caught by police in Assam when I was uh, covering uh, the anti-citizenship -citizenship law uh, enforced by the India to throw out the Muslims of, uh, of India. Uh, so they came knocking at my door in the middle of the night uh, twice while I was reporting from Assam. And... Uh, I was quite stunned by the fact that they were out there because I was the only Muslim journalist working uh, in, in, in Assam. And also one of the first ones to report for the international media because uh, the Indian government had suspended uh, internet, foreign press to visit Assam and still the ban is on for them. So you can understand uh, how difficult can it get uh, for a Muslim and obviously a journalist and a Kashmiri. 
Okay. And, and kind of following up on, on what Maria was talking about, what kind of message do you think uh, what's happening in the U.S.? How is that being received in India? Do you, do you think it, it would be used by the Modi government or other governments to justify uh, being har even harsher on journalists? I think I'm pretty uh, sure that uh, because a country like U.S., if they are doing this to the uh, press where it's a democracy and, you know, South Asian countries, and I'll, I'll talk about South Asian countries because I'm based here, they'll take a cue from the U.S. And, you know, if they don't care about journalists over there, why would these government care? They have already been repressing us for, for many decades now, be it Pakistan, mm -hmm. India, Bangladesh, Nepal, or Sri Lanka. They've been doing all sorts of uh, uh, problems to the press. Journalists have been killed, not just attacked. You know, journalists have been killed in so many incidents. In Afghanistan, you see it every day. So I think it'll be a, you know, they're setting an example for the rest of the world. You know, if, if we don't do anything to them, uh, if, if uh, we can't, you know, people can't stop them, uh, why, why would any other government stop, uh, you know, themselves by attacking the uh, so-called fourth pillar of the democracy in India? Right. Okay. We are getting a lot of questions coming in on the chat. I'm seeing them come in. So we're going to take some of those now. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the top of the list here. Um, so uh, one question, I think this is probably going to be for Maria. Um, is there a standard policy for U.S. local police departments in dealing with journalists? even if it's not widely embraced. How is the media, how is media training handled for street cops? In other words, is there anything happening, uh, you know, to, to train police to, and are there policies that are uniform or is it really just locality to locality? So, um, as Patrick said before, I often, as the emergencies director, work internationally, um, and I can only answer this question anecdotally. Um, I do know that there is training going on with, with uh, specific police departments. Um, I know that the NPPA, the National Photographers, oof, what does it stand for? Uh, I'm sorry? The NPPA, that National... Press, Press Photographers Association, is that it? Do, they do training workshops with police. Um, it, they're very similar to the workshop they do with journalists. Um, but tailored toward police to um, to educate them. I know that there's some of that going on, or what there was some of that going on around um, elections as well, especially in uh, cities that were hosting the conventions. But I, I honest, I, I sadly can't cannot answer um, definitively um, about a policy or or the types of training that that are happening. Um, with police officers. Okay, great. Well, thanks for pointing us to some resources that might be able to answer that. Uh, we have a question for Linda here. Um, this is from Kathy Keeley. Um, first of all, do you have health insurance? And secondly, that's a big issue for freelancers. And so Kathy also asked, what is your advice for freelancers who are out, don't have the backing of a news organization when they're covering this stuff? Um, yeah, I do not have health insurance, um, so I'm going to be a self-pay, uh, and my estimate is somewhere between fifty and five hundred thousand um, dollars. We're not sure. It depends on how many surgeries I wind up needing. Um, I mean, my best advice is I look. This is America. Um, you're going to go to your job and you're going to take your risks um, with or without health insurance, no matter your line of work. Um, it, it is frequently best to know where there's clinics and urgent cares wherever you're going to locations so that if something does come up you you know where you can present for treatment um it is good to i uh, have a very healthy uh, online plan base the more you can grow that and the more people support you um the more folk will be able to come out if something does happen like what happened to me and and hopefully be able to help you get a fundraiser um you know it's an unfortunate fact of of, of american uh, the american health industry that that so many of us are, are put in this position um but i don't think that it's necessarily you know a journalist specific problem and i don't think that journalists is, you know, even considering what happened to me overall, a more risky field, you know, than a lot of fields that are mostly uh, covered by uninsured workers. Um, the other thing I would say for freelancers is if you can get a, a short term contract with a news organization, um, go out as a stringer for them rather than as a staff writer, sometimes you're entitled to some protection that way. Um, and they would be able to help you if anything went, you know, catastrophically wrong. 
Okay, another question for you and then one for Emmer from the same person. Um, the question for you, Linda, is, is uh, well, first of all, you're so brave, more power to you. So I'm sure that the questioner is speaking for lots of people in saying that. Um, what is your next plan of action? And then you were attacked by the very people pledged to protect you. How do you feel about that? Um, you know, again, I, I think that that last bit, and I'm going to take this in reverse, that last bit is not specific to journalism. And I think it bears pointing out that I'm incredibly white. Um, and so the, the question of, of the people who are meant to protect me being the ones to hurt me is just sort of an American reality for millions and millions of people. Um, and I would encourage you to go read uh, Black and, and, and um, you know, Hispanic and, and Muslim writers on this topic because they've been dealing with it their entire lives. Um, and they're gonna be far more articulate on that than I am, you know, a week after a head injury. Um, the, what, what's next is um, I, I, I'm out of the field. I'm obviously not allowed to get anything, particulates or smoke or anything in my eye um, until that heals up in about six months. Um, so meantime, I'm gonna be focusing, you know, thank God I'm not just a, a photojournalist. I'm also an author, I'm a writer. Um, so I have other work that I'll be able to focus on in the meantime. Um, and, you know, once we heal up, we'll see if, if I'm even capable of going out because I, what with the, the blindness on the one side and the lack of depth perception, we'll have to see what the, you know, how I navigate the world and see whether I can go out on location or whether that would be risking the, the safety and security of those around me um, having to make up for, for that disability that I sustained, um, which, you know, there's a whole lot of rhetoric about about disability being, um, you know, folk can do anything they want and being empowered, but like the fact remains if I'm tripping over curbs, I'm not gonna be very much good in, in a high intensity, high conflict situation. So then it'll just be a question of, of waiting and seeing how I heal up and what I'm capable of. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm gonna keep working. So okay. that's not in, in question. And you made, a, I think at the, at the top of your comments uh, to this question, you made a really important point that I wanna emphasize that, uh, attacks on journalists are horrific, but uh, lots of other people are being attacked as well. Uh, people who are exercising their right to, to demonstrate, and we want to recognize that. Uh, obviously, we're focusing on journalists in this chat because uh, that's, that's the work that ICFJ does, but, but we, I completely agree with you that we don't want to lose sight of the fact that many other people are also uh, being attacked. Uh, the question for Amr is um, what, according to you, should be done for the safety of journalists in Kashmir, what 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 do you think should happen, and and is there anyone working for uh, protecting journal? Obviously, you mentioned CPJ, but anybody within India working for the protection of journalists covering Kashmir? I, they used to work, you know, rigorously for for a long time, but you know, since the Modi government has come to the power, it has stopped, you know, because you see uh, two journalists are still in the jail, and uh, uh, nobody's bothered to you know take their case. It's just the international organizations who have been trying to help us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks really difficult that, you know, uh, any organization for that matter could help uh, in the Kashmir cause because after all, they need to work in their newspapers or organizations or, you know, uh, whatever they're working on. Uh, and, you know, the government uh, pressure is always on top of them. So it's, it's quite difficult to, you know, find some sort of uh, help from the Indian state. But yes, uh, uh, organizations around the world have been taking the Kashmir case for last for last nine months have been really uh, amazing, you know, uh, all over the world, uh, people are focusing on Kashmir only because, you know, uh, the Modi government has put up really strict measures when it comes to the press. Uh, I have a really good question here. This is from Elizabeth Rivera. Uh, it's for all the panelists, really. Um, now that it's very clear that repression is a reality in the US, what are journalists doing or what should they be doing to prepare to cover the elections? Um, so, you know, we have elections coming up, as everyone knows, and um, we've seen, uh, you know, attacks on journalists covering elections in the past in this country, too. So what, what is anything special being done or should be done? Somebody asked, the, the second part of the question is, are we reaching out to journalists from other authoritarian uh, governments and or police states to see what they're doing at, at, in elections? Maria, maybe you can take this one first. Absolutely. Uh, actually, the, this year, CPJ's main focus before COVID-19 
had been U.S. elections. Um, for a long time, we have been very focused on elections around the world. Last year, we worked um, a lot in India and worked in South Africa and Guatemala, and this year, our focus was, was the U.S. So we have a U.S election safety kit and, and a lot of information again on cpj.org that everyone can access and again um, have experts available to talk to individual journalists or newsrooms about how to prepare. I think this is going to be really, really important. We were preparing for it to be um, a risky assessment. Uh, sorry. A risky story uh, that required a risk assessment, um, but uh, what the the events of the last um, of the last week have shown is that it, it is going to be a high risk um, assignment. So uh, I think it's important for um, newsrooms uh, to be preparing uh, as much as it is possible to be uh, doing training workshops. There's there, there are lots of things that are available online right now. Um, to be and to be talking to the reporting teams to be working on risk assessments think about what the risk is going to look like and of course at this point we, we don't know it's something that's going to be moving so um, be checking all the time um, and I think uh, Patrick and I also are very involved in an organization called the ACOS Alliance a culture of safety that works with freelancers and has a ton of resources that are available for freelancers to prepare uh, again, free training, uh, but also a lot of resources for commissioning editors. So um, I think, uh, again, because I, the meat of, the, of, of safety for the election is going to be certainly the training and the risk assessment, but that ongoing conversation between editors and reporting teams about what, safe, what kind of things you're comfortable with, how are you going to prepare, what kind of equipment do you need with um, the violence and COVID-19, there's going to be a lot of need for personal protective equipment. So, um, you know, it's, it's important to, to feel empowered to have that conversation on the side of, of the reporting team and for the editor to have the tools and the education to make that happen. Um, that said, you know, we, quite honestly, we don't know what it's going to look like. We still don't know what the conventions are going to look like. We, we don't know if people are going to be trapped. Be, be able to travel, how many people are going to be traveling. So it's a story that's very, the safety story as well as the political story is one that's very much, um, that, that, that's very fluid. Um, but again, we're always updating this information. So please sign up to get, to get this, um, to get these tools that come right to your inbox. Great, thanks. And, and I do want to mention that the ACOS Alliance that you, that you brought up is a global organization, so that those resources are for people around the world, uh, not just U.S. journalists. Um, and I think, uh, you know, talking about elections, another question is whether there will be big rallies as we've had in the past. Um, President Trump has done some of that, has started doing some of that. Um, uh, Joe Biden, really not so much, but we're going to have to see whether that happens. And that is one of the places where we've seen potentially dangerous situations for journalists as the president from the lectern is, is pointing out journalists and sometimes egging on, uh, you know, um, anti-journalist rhetoric. Linda, I asked um, Maria about uh, whether this kind of filters down from the top. Um, do you have an, any thoughts on that? Do you feel like um, that our, the government is, is um, sort of fomenting some of this anti-journalism activity? I mean, I think that when people are attacking um, journalists on the street with the exact same rhetoric that the president has been using for the last two years, one might not be able to draw a specific causality, but it's fairly obvious where they got that language from. Um, so, I mean, I, it, it stretches credulity to say that that the rhetoric hasn't had an impact. And in fact, like, I've, I've been covering these things since, you know, 2015, when he first came to, like, real prominent attention as, as a candidate. Um, and, and there has been an impact in, in how safe I feel on location, um, in the tone of conversations that I might have with people. 
um, who are, are uh, see themselves as, as uh, patriots in, in the Trump style. Um, you know, because those conversations, I also reported from Malheur and was embedded out there when the Bundys took over the wildlife reservation for weeks. And so, you know, I used to be able to go and, and have fairly productive conversations, even if I personally disagreed um, with folk. Uh, and it, that has become less and less possible. And it's become more and more hostile um, to where now folk will be like, well, what outlet are you with before they decide, are they going to talk to you? And depending on what they perceive the outlet to be, um, whether they think it's, and, and this happens on both the right and the left. You find um, left-wing protesters refusing to speak with people from their local Fox affiliates because they assume that those local Fox affiliates are somehow connected uh, to the opinion section of Fox News mm -hmm. um, and things like right. that. So I think that that, that that fights both ways, and I think that it's a question of polarization. Yeah, um, and uh, let's see, uh, so, um, one of the other questions that we have here is about uh, trauma and the sort of the psychological issues um, that might be affecting journalists. We certainly have talked about this with the pandemic as well, journalists who are covering uh, death and, and in, you know, people suffering. Same thing for people covering uh, protests where they're seeing violence. Any thoughts on, uh, you know, whether uh, there are, what, wh where we can direct uh, people who are talking about mental trauma for for uh, journalists covering these issues. Okay. Linda, you go, go, go. I, no, I was actually asking, was that question for me? Because I thought it really was for, for, for you. I, I know I know Maria can can uh, speak to it, but I'd also love to hear from you, Linda. And I should mention, by the way, that uh, Brandon has unfortunately had to leave. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to come back, uh, but but um, that's why he's not getting any questions. In case you're wondering. But go ahead, uh, Linda first, and then Maria. Um, I, I think that institutionally, there's a lot of support. Um, I know, but I, I also think that any journalist that, you know, we go out and we see trauma and pain and horror, and it, it's literally our job to go focus on, on the most poignant of those images as photographers and the most poignant of, of those moments as writers, um, you know, and I think that that can't help but have an impact. Um, I also think it's it's weirdly slightly easier when it's your job um, because you, you have a chance to emotionally prepare for that. Um, and after years in the field, you start to kind of understand what sort of things you're going to be running into. Um, but I, I have often told new freelancers, get a therapist after your first couple of runs, because you need to have those tools to process through what you're seeing. And then, you know, once you've done it a few times, if you feel like you already know how to de-escalate yourself when you get home, you know what your, your comfort zone is, then you can just put those practices in. But every freelancer and every, every green journalist should have um, a therapist for at least the first one or two times they go out on location. Good advice. Maria? Uh, that's, that's awesome advice. Um, uh, so in terms of tools, uh, I saw somebody had, was posting it on the chat, but um, the Dart Center for Journalism and Trauma is the place to go to. They have incredible resources available. Um, we're also working with them to provide uh, d direct support. Um, but again, you know, th that, that's where you want to go for, for additional information. Um, I will say that um, I'm encouraged by people talking more about the psychosocial impact of working as journalists. I, I don't know if it's a generational thing. I, I don't know what's happening, but I'm really encouraged by, by people being able to voice it just like Linda did. Um, uh, we do think of, of this as a safety component. I don't think it's a, and, and again, like Linda, it's not something that you think about post fact. Uh, it's something that you should be preparing for and know that you will likely be affected. But if you are affected, you can make decisions that can compromise your physical safety or that of the people you're working with. So always think about how it's going to affect you and how you will respond and what tools you will need. And have, again, have that conversation with your editor and with your team. Um, and with this in mind, I wanted to uh, also talk about digital security super quick. Um, we have seen a lot of requests for trauma support for people who are uh, have been victims of online harassment or online threats. Uh, it is incredibly common in the United States, particularly uh, for female journalists. Um, and uh, we have already been seeing it with the protest. The very first case that I believe we documented around the protest um, 
was a journalist who, journalist who posted um, the incident online and was immediately doxxed. So while you're thinking about physical uh, security, safety, when you're going out in the field, you have to also be thinking about your digital security. Think about um, the equipment that you're bringing, what information you have in that equip and the equipment that you're bringing and how you're protecting it. And think about your online footprint or your online hygiene. Again, like as Linda was saying, it's for journalists, especially freelance, an online presence is so important. Um, but it's also important for you to know what personal information is there and to know that all your accounts um, have been protected. And the easiest thing with, for that is to use two-factor authentication. Uh, but again, uh, more details on, on that specific to what's going on in the US are on the CPJ dot, on cpj.org and a lot more broad information is also available there. Yes, great. Thank you for that point. That's really important. And Amr, I want to come to you. Actually, first, maybe you can you can speak to the the uh, digital security. What practices you use? Uh, we also have a question for you about what advice you have for journalists in the U.S. who may not have this experience of being under fire when they're covering something. You've you've been doing that your whole career, and uh, Kashmiri journalists are are probably quite used to that. So first, uh, digital security, and second, what advice do you have for U.S. journalists? Uh, I think, uh, as Maria mentioned, DAR Center is one of the best institutions to you know uh, uh, teach you about uh, digital security because I have attended a, a short-term course in the Columbia University for digital security, and it has really helped me. Uh, over the years, what I do is when I go out for, uh, you know, shoot a film or pictures, I carry a lot of uh, dummy cards uh, for my camera. Because what happens in Kashmir, when you get uh, caught in a checkpoint by the police, they often what they open your camera and they delete the entire footage. And it has happened very uh, often in, in Kashmir. So we always carry uh, 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 extra sets of uh, memory sticks and uh, also hard drives. Uh, in last August, when uh, I was filming for New York Times, uh, there were two films I was filming for them, and uh, it was almost impossible to get uh, filming out of Kashmir because there was no sort of communication with the rest of the world. It was a total uh, uh, blackout in the in Kashmir. Uh, so, in terms of security, what we did is we made a lot of copies of our uh, hard drives. We we had sent one copy through road, one by air, and one we had kept here. So a lot of different measures just to you know ensure that our footage goes out because there were many many checkpoints all across Kashmir. Uh, you know, police was always after you because obviously didn't want the world to hear what's happening in Kashmir, and that is the reason they had cut down the entire communication lines. Uh, so uh, you know. Uh, it was a manual job. I had to fly down to Delhi every, uh, you know, uh, every evening to send my stories. That was the only way to uh, basically file my stories. And I, I think I flew 19 times in, in a week, uh, sitting to Delhi, just to file my stories. Uh -huh. I used to come in the morning and go back in the evening. Uh, oh because God. there was no way, there was no way to file any sort of story, not even text, no fax, no phones, nothing. So I think uh, that really taught us a different sort of, uh, you know, ball game uh, because uh, there, was a, there was a time when you used to have a pager, you know, to send messages. Uh, there was a time when you used to use fax, but it had, we had nothing. So we literally had to fly down to Delhi and file a story and then come back in the evening because in Kashmir, we only have like seven to eight flights per day sitting in Delhi. And that's, the, that's one of the worst cases because you don't have night flights in Kashmir also because of the government regulations so uh, you know we just had a time gap and that is the reason you know uh, Pulitzer was given to Kashmiri journalists from the AP because they did stellar work uh, like we all did you know uh, by filing stories sending their memory sticks uh, through someone so I, I mean apart from digital security this is something uh, we did uh, manually you know I wouldn't call it digital security but yeah I mean there was this, this was something different uh, Second question, what was your second question? Sorry, it was about the rubber The second question was just about advice you have for US journalists who may be experiencing this for the first time, uh, physical attacks. I mean, look, uh, you gotta choose a side, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, you don't need to be biased, but uh, if there's a clash is going on, you, either you're behind the police or with the protesters, you know, what happened in Kashmir over the years, we used to be on the, on the side of where uh, people were protesting, you know, but what happened was police used to target media personnel as well. 
And after a lot of deliberations with the police, we then switched over to police side. And if you see all the pictures from Kashmir, they're always on the, on, on the protesters, facing the protesters, because you, know, you have less risk from this side because they usually don't fire. They just throw stones, which you can actually dodge them. Uh, but you know you can get caught. Like I said, like uh, Linda has been, you know, uh, injured. We have a lot of journalists who have been injured. I was also myself injured when I got hit with a pellet gun uh, two years back. Uh, so you know you always get caught around the situation. But what you need is you properly. You always need a helmet, you know. And uh, for freelance journalists, it is quite hard to you know basically get a helmet and an insurance or a gas mask and you know uh, someone to support you back because obviously you. You can't just work alone. You just you always need a backing from from an organization. So always have that sort of uh, communication with probably an editor or an organization and let them know that you're doing this kind of work because after all they might help you in some way. You know, uh, it's not that they're going to help you because they're out there to help people like us, people like freelance independent journalists. So uh, regarding uh, there was a, a, a question on rubber bullets or on what. On rubber bullets and tear gas shelling. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So one of the common practices that we uh, do when we don't have the gas mask is we we put on uh, salt around our face, uh, mm. on the forehead or in the face, and it really reduces the pain actually. Huh. Uh, uh, when you when you face a lot of tear gas, uh, what a lot of people do is they they go to the uh, tap and they use, uh, ta uh, put pour on some water that's the um, i mean at least in kashmir i don't know what sort of tear gas do you have because there are a lot of uh, different uh, tear gas uh, shells they use uh, in here we can't put water in our eyes because it burns once you put water so mm -hmm. that's one of the most common practices which journalists use they put water you know around the world which is which is which should not be done at all you know you should not put water I mean, you just need to move away from the place and then just open your eyes and, you know, let the, uh, you know, uh, it, it'll go away with the wind. Or the, one, of the, one of the things which uh, protesters actually do in Kashmir is they stand near a fire. So basically when police fires take a shells into your area, they, uh, you know, put up a small uh, fire around, uh, around the area and then they stand because the wind which comes from the uh, fire actually re reduces the pain of the tear gas. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the common practices which we use and, uh, you know, it's been going on for, 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 for a long time. Okay, that's very interesting. Most uh, people here use milk rather than water uh, to pour into the eyes, um, but uh, that's interesting to hear about the salt. I did not, did not know about that technique. Um, so uh, one of my colleagues pointed out, this probably is going to be a question for Maria, we've got a few minutes left, um, that uh, in her press conference, um, the uh, Trump's press secretary, uh, Kayleigh McEnany, I think, I think is her name, uh, basically defended the uh, attacks that many of, many of us saw of the police on the Australian journalists. And she basically said those police had a right to defend themselves. Um, I don't know if you saw that video. Um, what, what's your response to that? Um, I mean, if anyone saw that video, they were not doing anything. I think they were doing exactly um, I, I, I've actually, again, been encouraged by seeing the videos of, this is going to sound wrong. They were doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. They were standing on the sidelines. They were recording. They were clearly identified as press um, when, they were, when they were attacked. Um, there was no, I don't, they, 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 you know, no one was defending themselves there. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, yes, yeah. it, it okay. makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, I think it just, uh, again, brings us back to uh, the question of, of you know, bottom-down messaging uh, coming down from, from the top. But just to, to recap, I, I have been, I have, I, I have seen a lot of the videos of, of, obviously, of people who have been attacked. And I think um, it's interesting. A lot of people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they're wearing a lot of the equipment that they need to be wearing. Um, they're positioning themselves um, where they need to be positioning a lot, not all, but um, I'm, I'm encouraged by, the, by just seeing that and seeing how much preparation has gone into um, how people are covering the protests. Yeah. Great. So we are, about, I'm so sorry that we are not able to get to them all. This has probably been one of the most uh, robust discussions that we've had and more questions that I've seen on, on most of our, our 
webinar. So people are really, really obviously very interested in this topic. Um, any last words? I'll, I'll go to each of you for, for, for sort of a last word on, on um, what you'd like people to take away in terms of uh, the issue of attacks on journalists and, and what we need to be doing as a, as a profession to, to protect against that. Um, why don't we start with Amr on that? I think it is important for us to report what's happening on the ground because uh, many people are saying that, you know, you can be biased, but uh, what matters is you stand to the power and uh, uh, it's important because uh, this is, uh, you know, this is the, uh, this is the time when we need to uh, see what's happening around us because if this happens very openly and I'm really afraid to see that it's gonna, this is gonna repeat, uh, repeat itself in many other countries because US is a superpower and, you know, uh, if it happens in that community, it's going to happen anywhere because all the big publications, all the big media houses are in, in the U.S. And I also work for them, you know, for many publications over there. If this happens there, this is going to happen anywhere. It's already happening in many countries, but if it does not get stopped at this point of time, I, I don't know what's going to happen to the rest of the world and to the rest of the journalists. But that does not mean that we should stop reporting. I mean... This is what we do, and people need to know the stories of our people of, our, of, of this world. Thank you very much. That is such an important message. Maria, any last words from you in terms of advice or thoughts on what we should do? Um, well, let me echo um, what Ahmed just said, and it's, um, it's so important for the story to continue to be told, and it's so important to give voice to, to, to everything that, that's happening. Um, I think it's important for journalists to stand together also and to report, um, to, to help report what's happening to their colleagues, to their fellow journalists, um, and that gives a lot of protection. Uh, and lastly, um, I will say risk assessment, risk assessment, risk assessment. Everybody, there, there are lots of free um, forms that you can follow, but it's very simple. Have a, con a conversation with your reporting team, with your editor about the risk and how to mitigate it and what you can do if something goes wrong. The more prepared you are, the better you're going to be able to mitigate whatever happens. Excellent advice, thank you. And Linda, I wanna, I wanna close with you again. Um, thank you, especially for being here so recently after this horrible thing happened. And um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you recommend in terms of what you'd like to see us do as a profession uh, to keep this kind of thing from escalating. Um, I, I think we uh, need to become a lot more tech savvy as a profession, um, understand the laws a lot better, particularly in an American context. Um, so turn off your face recognition, turn off your, your, your thumb recognition, lock your coats with a password, wipe your phones before you go out or get a burner phone that you can record from so that if it's lost or destroyed, you're not losing or, or giving away information. Um, use Signal. Learn to use peer-to-peer -peer encryption. I use two-factor authentication for everything. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, most of us in a freelance context, we don't have editors. Um, we go out, we get the story, and then we try to sell it. Um, so developing a strong uh, a connection and a strong grouping with other freelancers, so that when you do get on location, you're you're with you're within people that you've worked with before. Um, you know how they work. You can keep each other safe. Watch each watch each other's backs. Um, I think uh, being more determined to tell the story, the further and further that, that the profession comes under attack, I think is, is important because the point of attacking journalists is to um, try and dissuade us from doing that work. And I think that the, the fiery we are, the more fiery we are about saying you cannot stop us from doing this work, the press will be free um, and we will come back from injuries and there will be three of us where there used to be one of us. Um, I think that that is, is, is potentially the, the best thing that we could do for the field. Um, so if you happen to be a journalist of any stature, find those baby freelancers, find those first timers, find the greenhorns, you know, show them the ropes, help them out, make sure that, that we're mentoring these folks that are coming into the field, particularly when any citizen can be a journalist for a moment as long as they've got a camera and a data, a phone and a data connect, connection. Um, I think it's very important that, that we share our expertise widely, we share our connections widely, and I 
think that the more that we do that, the stronger we become as a field. And I think that that's the one thing that you do um, uh, when, when people are trying to repress the uh, freedoms of, of the press. That is such an important message. Thank you so much. Um, I really think uh, you've summed it up, all three of you have really summed it up perfectly. Um, I wanna thank the three of you for, for being with us today. This was really a, a very important and very, very interesting webinar. I hope that people came away with um, not only a, an impression of what's going on here in the US and around the world, but also with uh, some resources that maybe they didn't have before for physical security, for digital security, for psychosocial health. Um, you know, all of our organizations are, are here to help and we welcome any kind of outreach from anyone uh, with suggestions. And um, I wanna just remind a few people, uh, a few more reminders uh, before we go. Um, we I have recorded this webinar and it will be available soon on the YouTube channels of ICFJ and IJNet. We will also post by tomorrow a write-up of the key points from the webinar. You can find that on the icfj.org and ijnet.org websites, along with write-ups of all the previous webinars that we've had. Um, those of you who registered for the webinar on Facebook will receive a survey, and we urge you to fill that out. It's extremely helpful for us in planning our future webinars. And we'll have more webinars next week and in the weeks to come. Uh, you can find out about all of our webinars uh, on the forum, the Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, or on icfj.org. If you're a speaker of Arabic, Spanish, French, Portuguese, we have separate uh, forums uh, from, for those languages and webinars running on all of those forums as well. And finally, I want to remind everyone that ICFJ and Columbia University's Tau Center for Digital Journalism have launched a global survey to map the impacts of COVID-19 on journalism worldwide and to help reimagine its future. To take the survey, visit icfj.org and you'll see it as one of our featured stories. Thank you again to all of our panelists, including to Brandon, who wasn't able to stay with us for the whole session. Um, really, really grateful to all of you. Please stay safe, everyone, and we'll be back soon. Thanks. Thank you.